Welcome back, everyone. Um, we've been having fun so far. Our first two webinars were just amazing, and I expect nothing less from this one. Many of you know Dr. Peter Tobias. He's uh, he's been at this for about thirty years. Um, not quite as long as me, but pretty darn close. And uh, thirty-three, I think. <laughs> You're 33? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm 37. Um, so, oh, geez, we're aging ourselves. Wait a minute. Let's re rewind. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm only 29 and a half. Um, so, uh, but <laughs> Dr. Tobias uh, has experience in homeopathy, conventional medicine, as well as uh, more holistic. And I, I hate to call it alternative. I keep saying that. I don't know what else to call it. It's not your traditional Western medicine. So uh, we call it being more holistic and, and looking at more than focusing in on one little thing. Thing. So, uh, Peter, thanks for joining me. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Hi, everyone. I'm so, really where are you here. these days? That's that's oh it's it's goodness. kind of like where's Waldo? Or, you mind. know, it could be Hawaii, it could be Canada, it could be Europe. Where are you? I don't I don't like the question, but I'm a gypsy. I I I think I read too many self help books, and <laughs> I ended up kind of not being able to choose between my home country, which is the Czech Republic, and and Canada in the warm weather as well. But anyway, it, it's beyond, beside the point. I'm in Prague right now uh, with okay. my little doggy packs and uh, spending some time with my family and mother and my nephews and nieces and my awesome. sister. And it's really a lot of fun because I get to experience different dog cultures and I get experience uh, the differences, uh, how dogs actually behave and act, which is really fascinating to me. But also that, that people really suffer or deal with the same challenges. Dogs suffer with the same problems anywhere around the world. And I often have conversations with people just as a dog lover in the park, which is really cool. So, yeah. It is true because I get consultation quests, requests from pretty much every country. Um, and they're all, they're similar. I've got itchy feet, I've got itchy ears, we've got itchy flaky skin, we've got greasy skin, we've got uh, regurgitation, we've got IBD. Um, it, it's, it's so similar. Uh, we, we deal yeah. with the same problems. And um, I think that also speaks to the fact that over vaccination is not just a US thing. Um, overuse of chemicals is not just a US thing. Uh, feeding dead food, that's the only way I know how to describe it, dead, um, highly processed food is not just a US thing, uh, because those yeah. those companies that have it here have it around the world um, and uh, causes the same problems. And, and frankly, the veterinarians are uh, pushing hard for those sorts of things. So um, it, it almost... I almost feel like I'm a little bit of the anti-vet sometimes, but I'm really not. I love my colleagues. I just kind of wish sometimes they do things a little differently. <laughs> you know, I have, a, I have a philosophy about that, right? Like when, when we are chosen for school, uh, we're usually A-type because we wouldn't really go through vet school otherwise. <laughs> and then we are told that if we don't do as we're told, we would fail. So we kind of get used to following the rules and... Um, the rules are set by those who are kind of in bed with pet companies, whether through research or, you know, through the lavish dinners that they feed us at conferences or whatever it is, or the conferences that they sponsor, right? So I, I actually do believe, and I, I, I make sure every time I speak in public, in any way, in form, I make sure that people know that most veterinarians are caring and they're really convinced that they're doing actually the right thing. That there are very few people who are doing it for money, I'd like to believe. And there are some that do, who do, but, but I-, I If they're really doing it for money, they'd have gone to med school. <laughs> <laughs> they, they probably shouldn't go to veterinary medicine. I always tell people, you know, every hundred dollars you pay at the veterinary office, the vet takes 20 maybe at the most, right? And if he was lucky or she, so, so that's how it is. But anyway, um, yeah. So are we talking allergies today? We are going to talk about allergies today. So uh, the, the title that was chosen was Skin Allergies, Natural Ways to Help Your Dog. So um, I, I know that allergies are a huge problem. And um, I, I kind of get a little bit tired of seeing the same social media conversations about it's yeast, it's yeast, it's yeast, everything is yeast, everything is yeast. 
Yes. Not yes, always yeast. Yes. Um, and it's amazing how many cases of allergies with these dogs that are really miserable end up turning out to be something like scabies. Um, so you, you don't want to count out getting some good diagnostics done on these things. Um, but, uh, you know, every holistic veterinarian kind of has their own ways of handling different problems. Um, you know, some people love dealing with IBD. Some people love dealing with allergies. Some people love, I mean, me, I like dealing with the mitral valve disease dogs just because they're near and dear to my heart. Um, mm -hmm. So we all have our, our different focus. And so I'm sure that you have a lot of things that you have used for your patients um, that I'm not even aware of. And I learn from these just like everyone else does. So I'm excited to see what you have <laughs> to, to give us information wise. Um, and a uh, quick question on the side, are you doing consultations at all? Like, can people I get a consultation you know, with you? I don't do consultations. And the reason why I don't is that um, it just turns into pulling me into several directions. So what I try to do, actually, I empower dog lovers around the world, similar way you do. And, you know, before we started, I was just I was just telling you that I feel like we go back to the college together, even though we've never gone to school, we become silly and, and, and so on. And I also love about you that you are very genuine and, and you kind of seem like you stop caring what other people think about what you say. And you just basically <laughs> come from your heart and just, you know, just say what you think. And I love that about you. Yeah. Lawyers and don't like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you just have to do, like, you just have to say that you don't do lawyers and then people will leave you alone. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I used to go to the dog park with my first dog, Sky, and I used to say that I don't do dog tickets, like, you know, buy law tickets when I had him off leash. And I haven't gotten a ticket until he was like maybe one or two months before he died. Then I got a ticket. <laughs> and uh, so I, and I forgot probably to say that I didn't do ticket then on that day, but anyway, <laughs> so allergies, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm going to throw a little bit of a wrench in the whole allergy situation. Good. Number one, I used to suffer from allergies from very early age. And I know what it f feels like because when I was um, a teenager, I used to ride horses and we used to do hay and, and, and collect straw and, and, and bales. And, uh, and it was like, you know, I couldn't breathe for six months out of, out of 12, basically every year. And it was absolutely exhausting. It was just so horrible. And I ended up on all sorts of different antihistamines and, and then steroids and uh, vax, you know, the, 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 the allergy shots and all that and nothing really worked. So crazily enough, and I have no idea how it actually, who made me or what made me, because no one made me, I started actually reading on allergies and I basically cured my allergies through diet, which was kind of neat. And then I went to vet school and I forgot about everything. And then it took me about 20 more years to figure out that most allergy dogs actually are not allergic at all. And, 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 and so my perception is, and I can, you know, I, I would say that about 20% of the allergic dogs that are diagnosed with allergies are allergic and then the rest has something else. And I will keep you a little bit in suspense. How much time do we have actually today? I just well, you can take as long as you want. We're scheduled for an hour, but. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. We'll try I to keep to make it around there. for my friends who are coming and family. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, so, so about, about 20, you know, roughly about one fifth of these dogs that are diagnosed with allergies are actually allergic and they have, you know, they have true allergic symptoms when uh, the body overreacts to uh, some sort of allergen, you call it allergen. Um, from my perspective, allergies are not the disease itself. Um, it's a symptom of a disease of the immune system right? The immune system is basically overreacting. And there are many different reasons why the immune system overreacts and, and creates antibodies against something that is actually normal. But I will show you actually some slides here and I will okay, kind gonna, of... Um, I'm going to make you the host okay. uh, and then you can do screen share. 
sounds like too much responsibility, but I'll, be, I'll try to do my best. <laughs> well, the responsibility <laughs> is I'm going to have to take that back or you're going to have to end it at the end, but that's about it. <laughs> no, you'll take it back. You'll take it back. Uh, anyway, so, so for example, you know, these conditions, can you see my screen now? I yes, can yes. You can. Anyway, so this would be conditions where people would say, oh, you know, these are allergies, right? Like, you know, the, the alopecia or missing hair around the eyes and the missing hair and hot spots on the body and then more like pollocking. Like, I know that these are pretty extreme, right? But, but you know that these dogs would most likely get diagnosed with allergy, allergies. Um, you know, allergic reaction, I'm just going to do a little bit of a summary. Obviously, there is a reaction of the antibody and antigen when the body... Um, I need to know that, Judy, but I'm just kind of explaining for everyone no, please. else. Uh, yeah. the, body, the body basically kind of misfires, right? Like it attacks, it attacks something that should be benign. And then it ends up with all sorts of different things. These are actually true allergies and usually they're fast onset. So if we have really true allergic reaction that is like, you know, release of histamine right away when the, the allergen kind of triggers the whole uh, reaction, then we see it very fast. And I used to see it very fast with me. Like I would have, you know, there would be cat walking in the, in the, the exam room and I would, uh, it would trigger my reaction. I would touch my eye and within five minutes, I would have no eye, right? Like, like the little boy down here. And, you know, we, we kind of, when we see these skin conditions that I just showed you, we, we, you know, we try to figure out what's going on because we try to help when we expect it to help. And nothing really worked. Like I, I did allergy testing with my patients and I did all sorts of different things uh, and it didn't really work. So then at the end, I thought we'll just put your dog in the, in the little Leica suit. This is actually a, <laughs> this is a, this is a doggy astronaut suit. Would you believe it? I don't have, have no idea where I found it, <laughs> but just kind of see the true allergies, the 20% of the allergies that I'm kind of considering real being a disease of the overburdened and depleted immune system. So, you know, diet when the, when the gut is out of, out of tune, when, when the, the, the wrong diet is giving to our dogs, then uh, the immune system starts actually misfiring and, and being ill because 80% of the immunity roughly is in the gut. Uh, then toxins, uh, they're basically like the hooligans in the soccer game, right? They disturb the whole body. There is about 37,000 billion billion chemical reactions happening in the body every second and if you start adding arsenic and mercury and all these other pcbs and and who knows phytoestrogens and other substances that are not belonging to the body then it's a crazy mess so then missing nutrients right like i acknowledge or try to try to teach people that that the soils and our food is not what it used to be because we actually don't compost. We actually throw the re remnants of the food in the garbage. Or if you if you get food from somewhere California or Florida and you bring it up north, uh, then it doesn't end up back in the field in Florida and California. So the nutrients are moving up north and in the places where we don't grow anything, and they end up in landfill or maybe in the compost, but never go back. Right. And Farmers can really afford to replenish all the micronutrients and other uh, other nutrients, right? It's impossible. I'm trying to do that on our pasture fields right now. It's uh, a long haul. <laughs> it's and it's a it's a lot of work, right? Like I I get kind of obsessed about trying to put any every banana peel and everything in the compost, but it is hard. Yeah. And then vaccines, vaccines, you know. How many how many vaccines or antigens does a puppy get within two months? Roughly about thirty, right? Like crazy amount, like twenty to thirty, somewhere there. So it's like the immune system registering twenty or thirty different diseases within a very short time, and the immune system is immature. I usually say that it's like making a three-year-old cook a dinner, right? And that's just insane. Uh, and stress, obviously, affecting the adrenal glands, inhibits the immune system and all that. We know that when we are stressed, we are more likely to get a cold. So, you know, the body gets polluted. It looks probably like this little <laughs> cabinet, right? Like it's just no fun. So uh, allergies, just remem remember everyone that allergies are a symptom. They're not the cause. We, you know, we usually use the word allergies as an excuse for saying, I don't really know what the hell is going on, right? <laughs> That's just something, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but, you know, so 
from my perspective, the true causes of true allergies are somewhere right here, right? Uh, from processed food to toxins to nutrient deficiency to stress and vaccines and 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 dairy and grain. I think that in humans, especially, but also in dogs, um, dairy is really hyper stimulating, right? Like I, I think that there is a lot of. <laughs> I I say that milk when we give milk products to our dogs, it's like you know, or or when we eat milk products, we basically are the only mammals who do that post weaning. And number two, uh, there's a lot of white blood cells and a lot of basically pus cells in the milk, right? Like we, they, they, the dairy industry says if there are only that many pus cells in a white blood cells in the milk, it's okay to consume. And when there's above that limit, it's not okay, right? But it's, it, there's a lot of antigen material in milk and the immune system can, can um, misfire and start reacting to it. Obviously, the antihistamines and the different drugs that we give for allergies, it's like taking a pill, sleeping pill at the time, our house catches on fire, right? Because we put the immune system to sleep. We put the antibiotics and the antihistamines and the corticosteroids and the antibiotics, they may improve it for, for some time. But as you know, Judy, it doesn't work for very long and we kill the microbiome and we make another mess out, out of the body. Plus, you know, it's just, it just a vicious circle. And it breaks my heart to see these five-year-old dogs that are destroyed by drugs or, you know, even younger sometimes, puppies, right? Yeah. So I think that it's really important um, for us to dare to kind of look around and you know even if I address diet and if I addressed all the different elements and detox the body and so on many of these dogs wouldn't recover so that was my point where I was thinking what the heck is going on like this is this is not not right something is something is a problem so you know we I'm just not going to go through the dietary changes and all that stuff but I will go directly into the dogs that actually were not allergic. And the reason why I discovered that was when I started addressing something very, very different, those dogs were recovering. And first, I couldn't really believe it that our whole profession would be missing such an important part of skin disease and skin problems. And then I kind of accepted it as given. And then I thought, you know, it would be really cool if we could have a conference or something on that. And then I get intimidated by the fact that, you know, I've been to skin dermatology conferences. There's like thousands and thousands of veterinarians coming to town to solve skin disease and allergies, right? And With drugs, yes. Point, yeah, and, and, <laughs> and special diets and hydrolyzed protein and whatever else it is. Mm -hmm. Well, and whatever the pharmaceutical company is pushing at the moment. And, you know, I, I believe that they possibly even have a positive intention. Like, I'm, you know, oh, maybe do. I'm naive. I, I know that evil exists, number one. No, I think they have positive also... <laughs> intentions, but, you know, it's, it's, it's look at Apoquel, because a lot of people are talking about Apoquel. Uh, it was made with positive intentions, and it solved itching symptoms for a lot of dogs. Yeah. It does not cure the allergic reaction or imbalance, whatever, you know, the, the immune system imbalance that's going on, it doesn't cure that. It just basically stops the itching and the symptoms. Uh, but, you know, here we are, however many years later since the product came out, and now we have all these dogs with cancer. And now we've used it on enough dogs to know that, ooh, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. But it's not yeah. something that the pet owners are told about when it's prescribed. And shockingly, I am now seeing it prescribed for, you know, the dog goes in with a minor red ear, boom, you get Apoquel. It's the new prednisone. And I don't understand that use at all. Um, they're using it for uh, the neurologic symptoms in the syringomyelia dogs and the Chiari malformation dogs. And I don't get that at all either. Um, and I, I don't want to give my dog cancer trying to stop symptoms from something else. Sorry to interrupt you, but anyway. No, no, no. I can roll. Interrupting. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just listening to it. You know, I, usually what is enough for me to, to read the side effects and then go on FDA reports and just kind of read there. And <laughs> I've, I've had enough usually by then. But anyway, um, so 
let's, and this is going to be just really a little bit of a flyby, but I, I want everyone to ask questions as well. And uh, there's some articles and, and blogs and, and, and recorded webinars and, and our customer service as well that can help you find these links and these articles if you guys are looking for something. But I'm going to share screen a little bit again. So, you know, at the beginning, I, I shared some of these slides. So when you have a dog like that, I'm going to close the window, actually. Sorry, it's really cold. <laughs> I hope my little dog is not going to try to. He's on the balcony. But he may oh. <laughs> start barking and wanting to come in. Anyway, so when you see a dog like that coming in the practice, how do you feel? I, I, I would freak out. <laughs> like, you know, 20 years ago, I would freak out. I would go, oh my goodness. Now and I just look at it and go, yeah, we got to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, the most intimidating part is to start somewhere, right? So if you have a dog that has serious problems, before the time before the beginning of the process is the most difficult. So I would obviously do everything that I can on the level of changing the diet, no matter what this is, changing the diet, uh, giving the essential supplements, giving the omegas and probiotics and, uh, and, you know, maybe in some situations treating the skin, whether it's topical, some sort of herbal solution that would calm the skin and soothe it. But most of these dogs actually would not get better with just those measures. And so, and that, that was happening to me, even after I took homeopathy and I, you know, and I was pretty experienced with natural nutrition, I still wasn't, wasn't getting the results. So then I started looking and I, I, I love seeing the body as number one, as a system of energy particles, like electrons and protons, they're basically put together. They're, they're the same thing. Like if you look at this cup, or look at my hand, or look at your dog, we are made of the same stuff. And you know, this is something that, uh, that kind of intrigues me so much. Um, because, you know, in the past, I, I used to hear, oh, we are all one, and la la la, the kind of the new ages talk, right? And I wasn't really into it much. But Knowing that we are made of the same stuff, I realized that we really are all one. Right? So going back to the body, so it's a supercomputer basically made of the same particles and uh, it's an electrical system because without electricity, it, it would not really function without the electrons and protons and, and bosons and other articles basically interacting, it wouldn't function. And it's, it, it is a dog or a cup or my hand, basically only because it has a different program, different arrangement of the same thing. But looking at this made me realize that the body is actually, has to have a certain flow. And what if the skin problems and all that actually are happening because there is a lack of flow or some sort of congestion in those different areas. So I started looking at the spine and realized that um, you know, see the spine as a watering system in the garden. And, and the watering system has branches and the different branches basically originate at the different vertebrae. And I started tracking the different spots where this was happening. And I, I realized that the spinal segments were actually congested and sometimes really inflamed and sore. You know, when you go along with your thumbs along the spine and you know that some dogs start twitching their skin or they did, or sometimes they even try to bite. I use this technique very much. And if I have a dog that has a um, skin problem like that, what I do beside detox and providing all the nutrients and natural diet and treating the skin with whatever natural method I have. And sometimes we need to even use antibodies because it's such a mess, right? But rarely. I start working with my physical therapists and chiropractors. And I also start asking about what the dogs do. Because many of them do things that are basically the origin of this whole problem. <laughs> but I'm going to keep you in suspense uh, for a little moment. Um, licking of feet, feel, feet licking. Every single dog that licks their feet is diagnosed with allergies. And 
when I didn't have any results, I started asking what if there's a problem with the neck because the nerves supply the feet. And what if our dogs sleep because they have some sort of abnormal sensation the same way we put our, we feel when we put our neck out, right? Or when our neck gets tight, we spend too much time at the computer. And then I obviously started tracking these lines and thinking, oh my goodness, like the collars are right here. The collars are right here. And we have a lot of dogs and flex leashes and, 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 and choke collars and, and regular collars. And we have to get rid of the collar. Every dog, every, every dog that licks their feet, we cannot use collars or we cannot use harnesses that actually cut the, the li lines right here. Right. So you know, the bizarre thing is that these dogs started to recover. And I was going like, this is crazy. Like, you know, there are thousands of people flying all over the world, veterinarians trying to figure out what, you know, how to solve skin allergies problems. And it's not even skin allergies. And it's a simple collar problem. It's insane. So the same thing that, you know, the conditions around the eyes, like if dogs have, uh, and that usually happens, ears and eyes usually happen much more when dogs have the upper cervical spine misalignment or some sort of congestion. Many dogs like to play tug of war, they twist, they, you know, I put my neck out and it's horrible. It puts the whole system out. We know that the neck is actually, uh, you know, a very vital highway for the parasympathetic nervous system that affects the lungs and the heart and the internal organs and kidneys and digestive tract and everything, right? Um, so, so this is kind of, this is what I started to look into. Now, this is the kind of dog that you probably say, Judy, this is a Cushing's dog, right? Adrenal gland disorder or something. Or hypothyroid and, and or, yeah. Or hypothyroid <laughs> or something, hormone, something endocrine. And I agree. I, I wanted to actually say that, that it is most likely hypothyroid dog or some sort of adrenal gland disorder. So we cannot really put everything in the same bag, right? I don't want to say that every single dog that has allergies has uh, or is diagnosed with skin problems has spinal misalignment or an allergic no but this, be other this dog very well could have an adrenal you know endocrine problems out the wazoo pick pick a gland probably multiple glands mm -hmm. but it also may have any of those things that are on your list so that's part Maybe. of the problem of honing in and saying oh well, he's got hypothyroidism we're going to treat that and poof it'll be better and then it's not and you go hmm and, and I, I think that's the problem with traditional medicine. We hone in on that one thing that we get on a lab result, and then we kind of forget about all the other stuff. Exactly. So, you know, I like what you're saying, because um, the best approach is to treat what you see and what you know and see what is left and right. then do it over and over and over. <laughs> and sometimes these poor dogs obviously are too far gone or they have uh, some sort of pituitary gland issue or, or something that is more serious. Pituitary gland for everyone else is, uh, is uh, a little gland that is uh, at the base of the brain. Am I correct, Judy? <laughs> Somewhere there. It, it's the, I call it the general for all the other glands. Mm -hmm. uh, there is hypothalamus as well, and uh, and 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 that is that is governing the pituitary gland. If I if I remember correctly, see, like I'm now questioning myself. Isn't it awful? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so there's a whole endocrine system that uh, that um, that governs the the, the body, right? Uh, glands are powerful. Oh my goodness. If there weren't glands, there wouldn't be life, but there would be also a lot of much less war. I actually, I blame <laughs> wars for testosterone, testosterone for wars, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and maybe estrogen for some cat fights and arguments. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, going back to allergies um, and non-allergies. So imagine the body as a, as a garden where the spine is the main watering pipe and the branches go to to the different segments of the body, whether it's the organs and the skin and the extremities, all that. So what happens when someone, when, when someone pinches a hose in the garden, right? Like the carrots don't grow or the lettuces don't grow. Um, and I see the, the skin as the garden. When the energy, you know, when the segment is actually congested, what happens? The nerve flow, the blood flow and the energy flow, the electrical current that, that 
in acupuncture is called merid merid energy meridians, right? It doesn't flow. And, and if it doesn't flow, the skin cannot thrive or the organs cannot thrive. You know, I'm not sure what do you, what do you think of the idea that the dogs that have straight legs have very narrow interscapular region and they are more likely to have cardiac conditions, right? Like you're, you're, you love, well, you don't love heart disease, but you love helping heart dogs with heart disease. And I find that the narrowness and the congestion in that area, I mean, maybe even congenital and genetic can predispose these dogs to, to that dysfunction, right? So going back to the skin, what happens when skin doesn't get blood supply and nerve flow and energy flow? Well, it starts being weakened. And then the yeast and the bacteria and the mites and all that is more likely to, to kind of cause problems, right? So they're all secondary, at least from my perspective. Um, sometimes it can be toxicity. Sometimes the body pushes toxins out and it will end up with a pimple. You know, when I traveled for 30 hours straight with no sleep for two nights because I was traveling with my little doggy, um, it was pretty crazy. So I got pimples on my face after that, probably from the mask as well. But now I just kind of open a can of worms because people will be asking, why do I, how do I travel with my dog? I, I, I sleep well through my, through glass door when I was about 22 or 23, I almost bled out. I actually got one of the arteries in my leg and um, I still sleepwalk. And in order for me not to sleepwalk through glass door, I basically have every dog trained as a service dog. So I'm very lucky. I'm lucky, lucky. I'm very lucky I slept walk through. My dogs are lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going on a tangent again. What's happening with me today? Going back to the skin. So I would like to talk to you about the, the injuries, the, the activities that injure the neck and uh, the neck and the body, the spine, the most. Uh, ball retrieving and, and, and um, frisbee retrieving. Intense exercise that is not natural. Like dogs would not be chasing 30 bunnies in half an hour. They would chase one or two. Uh, and we go to the park and we basically hammer our dog's spine. And what starts happening, they, they basically have skin issues because they get tight in certain segments of the spine and they slip and slide. So working with a chiropractor, physical therapist, acupuncturist, someone who can actually release the muscles and work with the muscles, homeopathic remedies work, work really well as well. One of the archetypal remedies that I've used in, um, in lumbar spine, especially lumbar spine injuries is, is phosphoric acid. I'm, I, it, it's worked really well for me, I mean, in practice. And the other thing is that um, phosphoric acid is from the point of personality, it's all about friends and losing friends emotionally. It's very much a dog, right? Dogs are basically all about their people and, and they get really upset when they are not with their people and their pack. So it's kind of curious, uh, obviously colors. I have <laughs> dedicated part of my life to convince people that colors are not a good idea. And my first dog, I used to put a collar on him and, and a leash to the, to the collar because I thought he didn't pull, so it was okay. But then there were a few occasions where he would slip or, you know, or, or wanted to say hi to other dogs. And I think just not a good idea, even if dogs are not pullers. Uh, thyroid gland is right here. So if you want to protect skin and the thyroid gland basically is the driver of the metabolism and also healthy skin, um, it's super important not to use a collar. And I can show you a harness that, um, that I use at the end. But anyway, tug of war, another you know, reason uh, why the neck gets misaligned so what do we do about all these? Well, obviously, you may think some people will say, but my dog loves the ball. He lives for the ball. Well, dogs are fine, really. Like if we are fine with it, it's our discomfort, our own discomfort, right? I know when I see my dog not being happy, like when I can take him for a walk at 8 o'clock a.m. and do it at 10, it's my discomfort. My dog is absolutely fine as long as I'm fine, right? So gradually kind of wean them off, maybe throw the ball once or hide it somewhere in the park and they will look for it, go for hikes. 
Judy, do you, do you see people just standing in the dog park and chatting and not paying attention to the dogs and, 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 and once in a while they throw the ball? Like, <laughs> we need to move too, right? Our dogs came to us to exercise. So it's a good opportunity to stop skin disease and skin problems and also get some exercise. There you go. So um, anyway, um, you know, these are the techniques that I would use uh, or work with the practitioners. I don't use all the techniques. I'm not a chiropractor, even though I have learned to adjust my dog uh, from my chiropractor because I travel and I need, I don't always have that opportunity. Uh, do you do chiropractic, Judy? Yes. You probably do, right? Yeah, yeah. See, so you're much more advanced. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you have the whole toolbox as opposed to eh. talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, not practicing, so uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, anyway, we can, you know, I, I'd like to empower everyone, even if you have a simple rubber brush, the Zoom Groom, which is a really, it's made by Kong, I think. It's a good way to improve the energy flow. Just general massage. Dogs are a little more sensitive to massage. So you have to be gentle. Um, I love, I love basically good practitioner. Like if I, you know, if there can be good massage therapist or good physio or chiro or acupuncturist, osteopath, all those work. But if these people do not know what they're doing, then you will probably discover that within, I would just say, you know, if your dog is getting worse, be very cautious. If your dog is not getting better, give it some time. Is that right, Judy? Would, would you say that that's the, the approach? Yeah, it's not an overnight fix. Um, you know, it, if you think, and dogs, thank goodness, are much more responsive than we are. But if you think about when a person goes to a chiropractor, you're pretty much doomed to having to go three times a week for the, you know, the first six months and then twice a week for the next six months. And you end up in, you know, on the hamster wheel. Uh, luckily, our, our dogs are much more responsive and, um, Either that or veterinarians who are chiropractors are much worse at selling chiropractic to dogs. I'm not sure, but you can adjust them and come back in a week and do them and then maybe come back in two weeks and then maybe come back in a month. And I had a lot of clients who would just come in and get their dogs or cats or whatever tuned up. Um, uh, feline hyperesthesia syndrome, which is basically they stop in their tracks, turn around and bite their back. Uh, because mm -hmm. they've got a zinger going there. Um, those guys respond so well to chiropractic care and they don't need to have it uh, three times a week for the rest of their life. Some of them, it's a couple times a year or when they start showing you that exactly. something's a little out of whack. So um, really, really helpful. And I noticed you had T-Touch on your uh list there. Um, and my sister happens to be one of uh, Linda Tellington Jones, uh, upper level uh, teachers. She works with Linda all the time. Um, so for people who are interested in T-Touch, we certainly can uh, get some classes put together on that. But that kind of nice. stuff is, is really uh, so helpful for these guys. And we overlook it. And um, I mean, that's one of the things when somebody would come in, particularly with a dog with arthritis or anything where I would go down the back and I'm feeling what you're describing. You know, you take just two fingers on either side of the spine, you go down and they go, you know, or they go down or you get all the twitching or I've even yes. taught clients to get to the point where it's like, look, feel down his spine. Look, it's soft. It's soft. It's soft. oh my God, there's a rock. There's yes. a rock. Yes. We've got yes. soft yes. rock. And so I spent, um, a, a lot of time teaching clients, look, this is how, these are the massage moves I want you to use, or, you know, that this is how I want you to manipulate the skin, the muscle, that area. These are the exercises I want you to do. There's so many exercises, you know, stretches. And I, I learned all this on doing horse work and we don't think about it for the dogs so much to exercise their spines. Cause we're like, yeah, they exercise. They're out there. They're running around. They're jumping, they're playing, they're doing their thing. Yeah. And they're hurting themselves half the time, you know, falling the wrong way. Um, but it is very easy and uh, you're actually doing a good segue into one of our uh, sessions tomorrow, which is going to, uh, is uh, Dr. Michelle Broadhurst and she's going to talk about myofascial pain in the canine patient and how mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. how we mm -hmm. discover it. She actually does a lot of webinars for veterinarians trying to teach them nice. so they can nice. teach their clients. So, I mean, you're actually playing in very nicely <laughs> for what we're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> We are aligned, you know, I think that when, when you really let life flow, I think that it aligns much more likely than when we force it. And um, there's this really great book for everyone. Um, 
Um, her name is. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to find it. I have to look it up. Talk, Judy. Talk. <laughs> talk. <laughs> well, I saw one person mentioned it. Oh Lord! And do I have it? Yeah, I do. Um, oh, okay, okay, I got it. But anyway, this one, the four paws, five directions for acupressure, yeah. and it goes yeah. by. So there's a thing for hip dysplasia, for stifled problems. Exactly. So this is uh, really good for acupressure and they tell you how to, this is a, this, this book's been around for a very, it's four paws, five directions, been around for a really long time, but it can be uh, incredibly helpful for pet owners. Book. And there's another good book behind you actually on your Which one? right, right hand side up above. That That's one? the book. That yeah, one? I have one too. <laughs> well, for food. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, oh. what I meant is I, we were talking about, we, you know, we were saying that I was seg basically serving you nicely for the next lecture. Um, I think that when we let life flow, it works better. And the reason why actually I, I wanted to talk to you about the, or mention the book from Marta Beck, uh, and it's called The Way of Integrity. I will actually, I'm sorry, it's talking. Uh, let me just show you. <laughs> this is the... Martha Beck, The Way of Integrity. An amazing book. Amazing just book saw, for everyone who deals with any challenges. I um, think I just saw somebody post that um, on some, I think it was probably on a social media site that somebody posted that book and said it was amazing. Uh, amazing. Really fantastic. Like one of the best books in the last five years, at least. And, and a good cool. audio as well. Okay. Anyways, so it's Martha I, I, Beck, The Way of Integrity. Thank you, Diane. Exactly. Um, I'm going to show you one more thing and then we'll be ready for questions. So I just wanted to show you the, the harness and, um, and um, why I love this harness so much. So you can actually, you choose basically, it's made of three pieces and it's made in the UK. So uh, no child labor. Um, it is really nice and soft. Um, and there's a, kind of like an H piece up at the top. I'm going to try to enlarge it a little bit. Oh. It's not working. Okay. Anyway, so the H piece is the colored piece. And then there is like a little Y piece at the front. And then there's the girth piece. And if you have a bulldog or a boxer or a great Dane or a little chihuahua, you can actually get different pieces like packs is anywhere from large to small actually on his, on his harness. And it comes in, in two different widths as well for the larger dogs. So you can see what happens. Uh, you can attach the, the harness in the, the leash in the back or the front or both for pulling dogs. But the other thing is that if your dog pulls, just get a big bag of treats and spend a year teaching it how to heal. Because that's the safest way for you to prevent neck injuries and, and problems. I personally almost lost my mind over training packs on the leash, but he's healing now. And I can't believe it because I was thinking this dog is never gonna learn how to. <laughs> but you know, bag of treats and just teach them how to walk beside you with, with treats. I know that some people may not agree with treats. Who doesn't like food and being rewarded <laughs> with food? <laughs> anyway, so. A really great way to prevent neck injuries. And I, you know, there's another thing that I really dislike with passion. And very soon we'll be organizing a little campaign about retractable leashes. Ugh. And I will send, uh, I, I've already allocated about $2,000 and we will be sending a free leash, a gentle leash, a shock absorbing leash to anyone who sends us a video of taking a retractable leash and either smashing it with the hammer or driving over it with a car or something because the retractable leash teaches dogs to pull. It applies constant pressure on the neck. And when you apply the brake or when the dog runs, right? Then it's like a really bad chiropractic adjustment. Like it's the three-year-old adjusting a dog, right? So um, again, for most of you, you're probably surprised that I went from allergies to chiropractics and spine and, and neck and all that. But I'm going to go back to the whole protocol and I'll just give you like six steps, what you may want to do. And also, the, the, you know, you can go to my website and look up allergies and there will be some articles about what to right. do in detail. Nevertheless, um, this is my little Paxi Maxi. 
Uh, <laughs> his name is Pax, actually. Weirdly enough, um, I never knew that airlines and flight attendants called Pax passengers. So every time I talk to them, people laugh their head off because his name is Pax. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely unaware that that was the case. Anyway, this is the gentle leash. It's made in um, it's made in um, Canada by a native lady, and it's made of wool. And you may think, oh, this is really weak, but it's amazingly sturdy and shock absorbing. So maybe we can actually agree that Dr. Judy will would send everyone a discount code or something, uh, Dr. Judy, and we can we can do that too. But you know, yeah, I, you send us. Um... Remind you, me. Uh, we'll, we'll just we'll just make a little yeah. arrangement. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because I, you know, anyway, and and the the campaign, the the retractable leash campaign is going to be happening soon as well. <laughs> cool. So going back, going back, and I I don't want to take too much of your time, you guys. But going back, so what what do I do when I have a dog with skin problems? And I I'm not even calling them allergic or licking feet or some sort of you know abnormality around the skin. Itching, scratching, and oh, one more thing. So you know why dogs are scratching and itching? Most people actually think that it's itching and it can be, but they basically try to massage the sore muscles and the sore areas and they roll on the back and they chew and they scratch and they itch because the spinal segments, and I forgot to say that, obviously lead to muscles. And when the spinal segments are irritated or congested or spastic, the muscles will spasm up. We all know it, right? Like we all know what happens with our muscles when our back goes. So dogs actually, they can't really tell you that my back is sore, they basically chew and scratch. And on top of that, we know now that the skin is gonna be suffer too. So it just had a vicious circle that you have to kind of solve. So number one, if you want to have non-allergic dog or dog with healthy skin, don't even tell me that you are feeding the best kibble there is. And I know this is really hard, but if there is a, you know, some people decide to feed kibble and I, I respect that. It's not my choice to, or more, not my job to tell you what to do. But if you have a dog with skin problem and you don't want to switch to natural food, either cooked or raw, it's like saying my roof is leaking, but I don't want to fix the roof. It's like, <laughs> you know, so that's number one. Then number two, detox, detox the body, make sure that, uh, that, um, that you basically get rid of toxins. And I do the detox regularly every six months with PAX and myself. Um, I, I like, formulating things. So I have a formula that I use, but you guys, you Judy have probably different products that you would also use. So uh, I'm just saying generally detox. The next thing provide the, the essential nutrients, which in my mind are minerals, vitamins, and I like plant-based minerals, uh, fermented vitamins, not just the synthetic stuff that, that makes our dogs nauseous, but fermented vitamins, then probiotics and omega oils. And the omega oils are kind of a challenge these days because fish is overfished and full of mercury and PCBs and toxins. Um, algae, I try to source algae-based oil and that is uh, easily GMO. I haven't found non-GMO source, even though people tell me that there is, but whenever I try to find a supplier, everyone ends up with a GMO production. So it's it's a little bit of a tricky thing. Krill possibly would be better, but it's food for the whales and, you know, environmental hazard and all that stuff. So I ended up with calamari because um, there are fewer fish and the, the calamari or squid is rising the population. It is still in the ocean. So there may be some toxins, but it's much lower on the, on the food chain. And what do we do? We microfilter because, you know, you have to make sure that the heavy metals and all that will not be there. But again, you know, there's a big discussion about what kind of oil is good and which one is not. Some people say, well, how about flaxseed oil? But we know that dogs don't convert it to uh, EPA and DHA, the most valuable um, fatty acids. So that's a little tricky one. So diet, detox, essentials, and spine. And testing, of course, veterinary exam. Uh, making sure that there is no endocrine disease. Um, did I forget something, Judy? 
um, you know, general blood work and endocrine blood work. Um, yeah. And, and proper exercise, more walking and hiking and trotting and playing than ball retrieving and frisbee catching and off leash time as well. Yeah. Super important. So when you kind of do, when you take this, I would say 80, 90% of, of the dogs that are diagnosed with allergies should be better. There's one caveat I would like to make. If your dog has been on steroids a lot, it's like, it's like taking your bank card, putting grease and oil on it, driving over it with the car and then try to put it in the bank machine and wanting to get money. From my perspective, the steroids do the same thing to our dog's bodies. They stop responding to regular normal treatment. They're so damaged. So don't give it up if your dog is damaged, but it's going to take you maybe two, three, four times as long, and it'll require a lot of patience and very tedious work with, with the veterinarian who is open-minded and also you know, you needing to be empowered because some people will be objecting to what you're planning to do. And they will, they will sometimes tell you strongly that you're out of your mind. <laughs> and you have to stop caring about that because your focus is on your dog. My focus is on your dogs. You have to basically lose the fear of losing your license or, or being laughed at, because if something works, who cares? Really, like that's, the, that's where freedom and the world kind of opens up because suddenly you don't care. <laughs> yeah. And you only care about what you want to do and what you love to do, right? So anyway, any questions, Judy? Any well, questions? Well, I, I have a great story um, that goes along with this. And this goes back 20 years ago, at least, uh, maybe 25. So I had this dog, it was sort of a spitz mixy thing, medium sized dog. And it had the worst lit granulomas on its front legs. And so, and it was very early in my holistic career because I was totally traditional for 10 years and then started switching over. And the first thing You're I learned, over. first thing You're I learned over. was actually chiropractic. So that was kind of the tool in my toolbox at the time. And uh, so we had done everything we could for, for this like, granuloma dog and, you know, this salve and that salve and creams and whatever. And finally, I, I think the dog was limping or something. And I said, I think we should adjust the dog. Now, I was very new to chiropractic at the time. So I was like, this guy's going to think I'm out of my mind. And practicing in southern New Jersey, they're not, you know, <laughs> they're not used to, to hearing this sort of thing. And he said, he trusted me and he said, yeah, we can do it. And so I adjusted the dog and I got just these huge adjustments in the neck area of the dog. And I said, well, come back next week and let's see where we are. And um, he came back the next week and the dog is running around. The guy's got this big grin on his face and the dog's jumping up and down. The lick granulomas were about 90% better. And he said, I discovered something about my dog this week. And I said, what's that? He said, my dog's neck was stuck straight forward. My dog discovered birds this week. It was the first time in its life it had been able to look up at the sky. It discovered birds. So the dog spent the entire week running around, jumping up and down, watching birds fly. Oh my goodness. And the side effect was the lit granuloma cleared up. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. you know, it, you, you absolutely are barking up the right tree. Uh, there is so much that goes into having, I mean, that's what acupuncture is all about. It's about chi and energy flow and meridians. And when you get something stuck along one of those meridians, what do we end up with? We end up with disease in that area that's not mechanically functioning correctly. We don't have the blood flow. We don't have the nerve flow. We don't have the electricity flow. And what are tumors? That's where the energy got stuck. It mm -hmm. stopped mm -hmm. right there, hit a brick wall, and then it just, you know, more and more stagnation builds up, builds up, builds up. So um, it's hard to find uh, people to, uh, 
or veterinarians, chiropractors, whatever, to adjust your animals. Um, but I think it's pretty important. Now, for those of you with SM and CM dogs, be very careful about who adjusts your dog. Those guys mm -hmm. are in a, you know, some of those uh, bulldogs with the hemivertebrae and the spina bifida and those sort of things. Really important to make sure that the person that you are using has experience. But if you can't do chiropractic, maybe you could do acupuncture to get that energy flowing, maybe massage or T-touch or Reiki or some of these other energy modalities would do that. SM and CM, I'm sorry for those of you who don't follow me all the time, syringomyelia and uh, caudal occipital malformation syndrome problem in what I call bubble-headed dogs, the round-headed breeds. So we see it very commonly in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. But we've also seen it in Brussels Griffons, Chihuahuas, Boston Terriers, any of those kind of guys. So, um, yeah, the activator is fine. Uh, somebody who's well trained with the activator, I don't have a problem with it. I use it. I've used it in horses. I've used it in rabbits, cats, birds. Um, but I also do manual stuff. Um, mm. So all you know, there is a lot to that energy and movement. And um, I started out in the horse world. And so I watched a lot of horses move and watching them in the show ring and seeing when you have an animal. So for people who show dogs and do a lot of work with dogs, when you watch a dog, watch Westminster and watch those dogs move and they're just, they're floating and all the joints are in alignment and the tail head just mm -hmm. has this subtle swish. You can see the, the movement in the spine, the swish in the spine. The spine is not supposed to look like a broomstick up their butt. It's, a, it's supposed yeah. to go this way and this way. And there's supposed to be all that looseness. Um, and when you watch animals move, if their legs are moving like pistons, they got a problem somewhere mm -hmm. up above. Mm -hmm. um, and confirmation certainly plays a lot into that. And if you have an animal with poor confirmation, they need even more work <laughs> done. <laughs> That's so funny. I started with horses too. Like I, I, I started with horses and, and I, I, I was working in exa equine exercise physiology as, a, as my first job. And then I started practicing after about a couple of years after I moved to Canada. I, got my license and I, yeah, so it's funny that we have very similar history <laughs> and we're troublemakers, right? We're a little rebels. <laughs> I guess. I, I don't know. As I get older, maybe I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm making less trouble or more trouble because I just don't care as much. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> just don't lose. I, I don't care about growing. being censored. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's Are what you? it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Uh, let's see. Somebody says, Dr. Tobias mentioned an archetypal homeopathic remedy. Was it for phosphoric acid? Can he say more on that? Yeah. So, you know, if I, and I'm not sure, Judy, whether you'll agree, but um, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> homeopath, so. <laughs> anyway, so what I, what, I, what I noticed that a lot of dogs have lumbar spine issues, right? Lumbar, lumbar and sacral lumbar issues and misalignments because, I don't know, they're just not created for the kind of, exercise and movement maybe with breathing like we basically didn't pay attention to it i find that when the muscles are tight in the lumbar area two things happen skin and also the gut goes and diarrhea sometimes are related to that uh, to lumbar spine congestion or spasm or tightness so i use phosphoric acid usually i use 200 c or 1m so 200C is the, the kind of, I would say, you know, moderate to high potency and 1M is a relatively high potency. And I would just use one dose and then I would repeat it in a couple of weeks. I like to use 1M in those situations where I see that, that things are happening and, and dogs actually respond really well to it, but 200C is okay as well. Um, it is known to basically, it's a good remedy for fatigue generally for fatigue of all sorts of different kinds. And it's a very much a remedy that, that um, dispositionally suits many dogs. So I don't really know whether that's um, a coincidence, but this remedy works beautifully for the lumbar spine and, and, and for the fatigue of the muscles in general. Like I gave it, I remember one dog, um, a border collie that was basically on the verge of dying. And it came to me 20 years ago and it was on anti-inflammatories and all sorts of different drugs. And the owner said, you know, they, they said that 
she's not gonna make it. She's not eating, and she's uh, she's basically not doing anything. And she was so busy and and lively, and she was about two years old. Her name was Bryn, and Bryn came to me, and I looked at her, and I thought, what does she do? What did she used to do before she burned out or before she ended up like this? And the owner said, well. She, I live in an apartment complex and she just runs all day long and the, the kids are throwing a ball all day long. So she was doing it for a couple of years and she was basically burned out. So I gave her phosphoric acid, one M, and she recovered so beautifully, so beautifully. I remember that. It was a really good, good, good story. And, and she lived uh, for many years and then eventually she came with another trouble. She got tick paralysis, uh, maybe 10, 10 years later, and she came completely paralyzed you guys if your dog drops paralyzed look for ticks if you have ticks in your areas um that's uh anyway so that's about phosphoric acid a good remedy to have uh somebody wants to know if you can share the brand that you use oh my goodness um i i really like helios from the uk but there's also hanemann's pharmacy right what do you use judy in the, in the i don't do um home homeopathy okay so I use, I use Helios, Helios, H-E-L-I-O-S dot C-O dot U-K. And there's going to be a whole bunch of different palette sizes. So just get, huh, you can pretty much get anything, but if it's, if it's as small as poppy seed, I give about 20 of them. If it's as small as a small mint, give about three or four and crash them in between two spoons. Like imagine two spoons, you put right. it in this spoon and just crash it. And then you throw it on the lip. You just kind of lift the lip and throw it. No okay. food half an hour before and after the remedy, ideally. Perfect. And if you give 200 C, I would probably give two, one M, but if you give 200 C, I would give even two doses, 12 hour, hours apart, and then repeat that in a couple of weeks. Okay. The repetition in severe cases can be done as often as once a week, uh, just to kind of give you general safe dosing here. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're about out of time. Uh, Peter, as usual, fun, engaging, entertaining, um, and very educational. So for those of you who have been watching, uh, you will get a recording of this sometime this next week after we finish the um, weekend, you will get an email with all of the recordings. So you can download them. You can go back and look at them. Um, you can go to Peter's website, peterdobias.com uh, and get more information on this because he has tons of blogs. He's very, very generous with his writing and teaching and educational value for all of you. Um, and I will put Gwen in touch with Peter uh, about the leash and harness, and we'll come up with some sort of deal there that we will also send out in that email to everyone. Okay. Uh, just to let you know, everyone, um, and Judy, too, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best salesperson. I always feel a little conflicted about that. But what I, what I usually do is what I do for my dog, I recommend. So everything that you will see, I recommend I do for my dog. I sometimes say it would be, it's much better if I have a solution than just kind of saying, hey, there's a problem and you solve it, right? So over yeah. time, I start kind of trying to solve it and, 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 and try to, come up with some sort of solution. But yeah, thank you so much for, for everything. And uh, we will send you the code. So yeah, before, Judy, do you have any any way of sharing codes on Facebook or? I can do it on um, Facebook or we will, I mean, we can do it a couple of different ways, but uh, one of the things we will do, everybody that's on this email list will certainly get that code first um because these are the people who signed up and uh there's there's quite a few of them actually we don't we only have a very small percentage that are live because most of them are going to get it um because they didn't have time to watch it today so so they'll get it uh so we'll send it out and we usually give the people who were actually up front and in line first they get first dibs and uh then we can certainly um spread the love after that <laughs> yeah, how about if we do it this way, Judy? Uh, you guys don't buy anything on my website until Dr. Judy will send you the code because I will just probably include everything just to kind of make it make it okay. fun and appreciate awesome. you for 
you know, appreciate you for listening to my little ramble. <laughs> okay. we, we will absolutely get that out to everyone. See, there's a reason why you guys get this early. You get, you guys are Johnny on the spot and that works well for you. Okay, Peter, you're still the host. So you're gonna have to click oh, on the bottom right where it says end the meeting. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.